So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Ryan Goodwin, who is the founder and um, visionary, I guess, for Mode Group, which is a building construction. I don't actually know exactly what it is you do, but it's, it's in the construction yeah. industry, right? <laughs> it is, yes. We're, uh, we're award-winning renovation and new home custom builders in Melbourne. Australia. Much better described than the way I could do it. Okay, cool. So I actually met Ryan through Business Blueprint. He was a speaker at the conference he went to in Fiji, and he talked about his journey in the Mode Group. But what you probably don't know about him is he's actually been an entrepreneur since the age of 14 years old, started off mowing lawns and all the usual stuff that we do as teenagers. And he's actually had the business for about 13 years, but only really stepped back into it about five years ago. And I think it's since you stepped back in, that business has actually grown quite substantially and changed quite significantly. Is that right, Greg? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, Ryan, we're, uh, sorry. We're, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, we've uh, been lucky enough to now see a team of about uh, thirty-three people and uh, turning over about eight point three million per annum. Yeah, awesome. Okay, uh, Ryan, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your story with the listeners, just so they can get a sense of you know where you've come from, where you've got to, and then perhaps a professional and a personal best as well. Yeah, great. Um, well, look, I you you mentioned that I've had the business and I have had the brand for about thirteen years now, but. Um, and that, about five years ago, I had um, actually, if I go back about 10 years ago, I'd been in the business for a few, but then decided that along with some other skills I'd learned through uh, a coaching, uh, performance management and consulting, that I wanted to try and blend those skills within my industry. And um, I decided to take on some larger senior national roles. So I was, was uh, financially reporting on large companies and director of a couple of home improvement brands and spent about five to six years, um, I guess, doing my second apprenticeship and um, <clears throat> really learned under some great mentors and got to understand what it was like to be responsible for very large business. We had some three to 400 staff members in one of them, um, financially reporting, growing teams uh, and understanding the operational value of, of um, the, the skill set, the commercial experience that most uh, business owners don't learn. We learn by accident and through experience. And so learning uh, with other businesses under some great mentors really kind of um, was amazing for me. But at about five years ago um, is when I realised I left the role of a, of a, a state-level uh, director and sitting on the board of a national brand that um, I was a young dad um, and starting not to see my, my at that stage, my first daughter, uh, who's now seven, but um, just not seeing her for a few days at a time, decided I, I wanted to be a father and not be absent like uh, some can. So at about five years ago, I decided to step back into my little brand, my little business. It was just ticking over in the background with a couple of things, really not much happening. And, and um, one of the lessons today is, is really in sharing is about doing what you're passionate about and doing what you love. And so it was always something I was good at and enjoyed helping people find solutions and delivering value to, to those homeowners in my space and my skill set um, takes me there. So I, I was um, yeah, able to make that decision, step back into my business about five years ago. And I call it a bit of a reset because although we've been around for a very long time, um, we really were drawing a line in the stand and saying, okay, if we, if I'm going back into this, what does it look like and what does it need to be? And um I guess from that stage, I'd already had some commercial experience and lessons and read a lot, a ton of books and listened to some great speakers. And I knew that I wanted to try, try and design the business that would serve myself and my lifestyle. Um, I won't say it's all perfect and done well, but the decision was to leave a really high paying, you know, high responsibility role to step back into something I had no guarantee that it was going to work out. But the most important driving factor for me was about creating something that was right for my family. And what drove me was that passion and confidence to know that if I kept turning up, then, then things would be okay. You know, I touched wood a few times, but here we are five years later. Um, we're a multi-award winning uh, builder in the renovation and new custom home space in Melbourne. We have a fantastic uh, showroom and interior designers on staff and a team of some 25 guys on the ground full time and 10 or more people in our office. And um, a yeah, really proud moment now to say that I've, uh, we've got a really great family knit unit and business that that uh, is slowly starting to operate without me. Um, and there's been some successes there. Um, really great to see the recognition for our team, but most importantly, working with great, smart people who are passionate as I am mm -hmm. to serve our community, to serve our market. And um, yeah, today sees us doing nearly close to about 100 projects a year, both small, medium and large, and we've got a great mix of that. Um, so, yeah, after five years, we're, we're now kind of at that point where we're turning over multi-millions and, um, you know, the role has changed for me and things have changed, but what's important underlying all this is I'm still passionate about turning up every day yeah. and love what I do. Doing what you love with people you love, hey? Mm. Fabulous. Mm. So what would you say, I mean, because you obviously went into this in order to get some of that family life back. Has that happened? Look, it's been... Um, as a kind of serial entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this, Deborah, it's, uh, it's funny. You start out 
And I think I've become sophisticated at a younger age in business because of my exposure and experience. And I'm very humble and grateful for that. Um, so being very deliberate with the, the steps and stages and the framework that I used or followed. However, I'm also addicted to working hard, like many great business owners, and I love what I do. And so sometimes it's hard to peel your, yourself away. So I would say that we, I have gained a lot of those benefits, but I've also created much more, many more targets ahead of me to chase. So I've gone from working hard to get there, getting there and saying, we could do a bit more, we could do it differently, or we could have more. And so I've worked hard again. And so I keep seeing myself probably, you know, every six to 12 months, um, trying to evaluate and consider, you know, sometimes we need to remind ourselves to look back and realise how far we've come. And that's a great, that's a great reward and something to really recognise. Um, so for me, as I get a little older, I've got to remember I, I can't keep running a marathon um, or racing. Maybe I need to slow down and run the marathon is a better analogy. But um, so the short answer is yes, we've, we've seen many benefits. Um, I spent many you know, weeks and months away traveling again with my family, being able to be around and be flexible in my own business, not far from home. But in saying that, I'm, I'm, I'm a driven individual. So that's seen me challenge ourselves and push ourselves and which in turn makes you work harder and, uh, you know, put your finger in many more pies. So at the moment, I'm going to say <laughs> I, I absolutely recognise some of the benefits of the effort and our plans, uh, but also I'm right in the midst and right in the middle of pushing hard and working for that next level again. Sure. But we did actually share when we talked before the podcast, you know, you've been away and spent a number of weeks away in a beautiful place um, up, up magnetic island and and we're able to kind of go away with the family and still do some work but have some time with the family as well right yeah the balance there is really great in fact we're back there in a few weeks and so just about to start a beautiful house 100 meters from the beach actually my my mornings were literally um i wish i could manage it full time and i might aim for that but it it would mean an early you know start like every day a coffee the kids and my wife will slowly get up um, I'll do three to four hours work and by about 10 o'clock my kids are tugging at me saying dad can we go to the beach or can we go to the park I close the laptop and, and off I go from time to time I'll open it again uh, a couple of zoom meetings a week but aside from that yeah while I'm there it seems to work and I think um, it's a good lesson for individuals we need to put that first I think and make it work not just hope for it because um, yeah. it won't come. Sure, cool. So your business has grown quite significantly in the, last, in the past five years. So if we go back five years ago, I mean, how many were in the business then? Uh, it was literally myself. Um, yep. I came back into the business and I said, I'm not sure. It's funny, actually, I had a beautiful sports car and a, a really healthy salary, the typical uh, you know, executive in a, in a large organisation. Um, and I literally said to my wife, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I trust in myself, my abilities and my, my history and experience, but... I'm still being cautious. I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm just going to get rid of the sports car. I'm going to buy a ute mm. and I'm going to see how it's going to go as a builder. And um, so I still have that ute today because I, uh, one lesson I learned from a mentor many years ago was to drive the cheapest car your ego will allow. And so I'm still driving. It's a pretty nice ute, but I'm still driving it. But it was literally myself and a subcontractor and we just developed. Within six months, I had a few guys with me in a couple of projects. Within probably nine to 12 months, I had a, a part-time admin person working next to me in my home office. Mm-hmm. We shared a very big desk. Um, and actually within about a year, um, we took on a beautiful showroom where we're now based. We've been here nearly five years. Um, we house about 15 staff in here and a showroom and we outgrow it. We've already outgrown it once or twice. So um, yeah, it was it was kind of at the time, I guess a metaphor of taking, taking the plunge or taking a leap of faith, but um, trusting in myself, I guess. And, and here we are. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about some of the highs and the lows on that journey. <clears throat> well, it's been a really interesting um, kind of few years. I think the first few years, at least, and look, we've seen massive growth year on year for five years running. In fact, probably broken some some records, I would think. Um, not by accident, not trying to take all the, the, the fame. It was more just, I think, me understanding our market and what our uh, consumers want to see. They want to see trust. They want to see a brand. They want to know that their money can be in good hands. They want to know that their journey through a building project is with the right people, character, um, the authority, marketing, you know, kind of put us at the right position. Um, so the growth, I'd, ha- I'd have to say, is one of our biggest successes. And, and, you know, it's been year on year, you know, huge, huge growth percentages. The challenges, um, some would be 
with the success of growth, bring the challenges of things like, you know, uh, managing people, hiring, recruiting, managing more people. So I, I'm a great design. I'm a great builder. I'm good with my hands. But I spend more of my time managing people's problems now, as I'm sure many of your listeners will um, probably agree that maybe at a management level or a business owner, they're probably faced with the same. You move away a little bit from the things you love. Mm-hmm. And you need to find a balance in that as well or put people in place. Um, but look, we've had great success through that. And I'm pleased that in my previous roles, I've had some experience doing that. And so that hasn't been a huge challenge for me, but probably um, a growth and success through our numbers and returns. Um, happy clients, numbers of projects. Our, 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 we've won quite a few awards year on year, actually. Um, so those are great. The last couple of years in Melbourne um, and in our construction industry have been really tough with COVID. So um started out with being huge success with the government incentives and grants it in fact grew our business you know again last year with a few million dollars worth of extra projects supported by government funding to our clients and so it just kind of we had this floodgate open up and everyone coming in and throwing money at us and we grew our team again and it was like wow what a you know we're riding this wave this this we're going to be great for the next 10 years and um this this kind of last 12 months has actually been the opposite. It's been the challenge of uh, material shortages, um, issues of the COVID kind of rollout. In Australia, we've had large national flooding multiple times, fires multiple times. And so what that did was actually damage things like our material plantations, you know, timber plantations, and it took and burnt down um, sawmills and certain kind of production facilities. <clears throat> um, and now this year we're battled with increased material uh, pricing, uh, labour shortages uh, and the like. So without trying to sound negative, um, Mm -hmm. those huge highs have been really massive. And albeit I never assumed would be sustainable for a long period, it's been really great to see everything climb and get bigger for us and see some successes with our team. Um, But, yeah, at the moment, probably some of our biggest challenges have been I guess not being able to control the market around you, even though, you know, a confident young guy like myself thought I was pulling all the strings and the levers out there. Yeah. Um, Mother nature or the universe really kind of can can take that away from you at the same time. So without sending negative, it's, it has actually forced me to come back to the drawing board a couple of times and really look at our strategy, our framework, um, you know, our accountability chart and, you know, what, what we want to be, who we need to how we need to become who we need to want to be um, moving forward. So I think there's positive, I'm not trying to say negative, but there's definitely some mega challenges and major kind of um, stressful uh, periods working through that in the last year, especially. Sure. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that because you've got the framework, because you know, you know, that you have to go back to the sort of the accountability chart, the strategy, see what you're doing. Um, you actually focus on the things that you can control or change, not the things that you can't. Yeah, basically, it, and that's said perfectly, and that's probably a point I'll raise throughout today's um, uh, chat with you, Deborah. It's it's really has been, I, I would probably say forced, although I'm not going to say that um, I'm a victim in that situation. I'm usually very, well, I am very, actually very strategic, and I've always got a plan A, B, and a C, depending on where things go. And and also when you have that dream of how your lifestyle might look, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's not the, the model you're operating under, but you know you need to work towards it. So I've always got a plan B and a C. Um, and I don't want to say force, but it has absolutely brought forward, I should say, maybe the, that way of thinking more. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've, I've had, an, I think, to be in, in some way successful. You need to have a healthy ego, right? All business owners need to have the guts to turn up every day, to do the hard work, the dirty work. And mine has been quite healthy for a number of years, but I must admit, Many years ago, I, I realised that it was no longer about that. It wasn't about the numbers and the the, the income and and uh, you know all those sorts of things, which many of your established listeners would also share. Um, but effectively, I've had to rethink. You know, how how many people do I need on? How many mm. team do I have to hire and fire and train? And how many clients do I need? Because not all clients want to be a good client. Not all projects run smoothly. How much risk do I want to take on? And if it comes back to lifestyle, you know, how do you get there? And is that just by doing more? And often it's not. Yeah. Interesting. So tell me, what is your role now in the business, would you say? So I am the sole director, um, mm-hmm. effectively CEO um, of the business. I am I am the, uh, the leader in the company. Um, I have still play a little bit of a role across different divisions or departments. So I am still seeing some clients and, and managing a sales flow, inquiry to sales flow. Um, albeit I used to do it all 100% and, and people would only call us looking for Ryan and walk into our showroom asking for Ryan and everyone was referred to Ryan, which was 
you know, amazingly flattering uh, until you realise there's no way in hell you can service everyone. And if we're to grow, it has to be not just myself. So I still do see a few. I see some tricky jobs or things that need maybe my authority to be involved in the relationship. But otherwise, um, I have other a couple of other team members that do that. Um, look, I spend more time these days managing, leading and coaching my team, uh, managing our meetings, our workflow, um, you know, kind of setting priorities in our business, um, being the strategic leader in the business as well, um, overseeing our marketing team and um, our sales and operational team and um, a little bit of the problem solving for our construction team as well when needed. But uh, absolutely have tried to, to um, train and, and uh, develop and empower the people, those managers per, per division so that um, they can do more of their work. But I, look, I'm active across the board, but it's much more strategic and much more limited. I protect my time a bit better these days and also really do trust in the people I have around me. So empowering them to do their work and to, to take responsibility has helped a lot. Mm. And, how, you know, we talked about doing the things that you love within the business and making sure you're passionate about what you're doing. Um, how do you ensure that you stay within that sweet spot? We call it the unique ability or your God-given mm. talent. What do you do to make sure that you are, um, in fact, not just you, but all of your team are actually working in that beautiful zone that will... <clears throat> Get the most value for you yeah look it's it's a really good question um i thought you're going to ask where is my sweet spot and i think anyone could share that but i yeah. think your question's even better how do you ensure that you are staying in that sweet spot because i don't think everyone would be able to answer that or understand the strategy um it's a very good question look i think not being too far away from um, everything that's going on we have quite an open office and i hear and know everything that's kind of happening and with that I'm absolutely not a micromanager, and I say that proudly to my team, but I'm, I'm really not too far away from a problem if there is one. I care enough for my people to understand where their strengths and weaknesses are, so that developing them. It's also a passion of mine. I've, I've become a performance coach and NLP practitioner, a few other um, consultancy-type training and lessons I've learned over the years. So I think for me, language and management, leadership, those sorts of things are a little more natural. So um, I think that's also an enjoyable part of what I do is be able to, to step in and help and reward and champion and, 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 and empower other people. So that's one thing that I think um, I do well and I manage that by just kind of keeping my finger on the pulse in the office and with, with the um, uh, energy levels of individuals and teams. Um, I, I am probably still remain in a little bit of that reserve sales area. So I guess without saying I'm the face of the business anymore, our brand really stands for itself, but a lot of the marketing material and collateral we do is still with me so that people think they're close enough to me, but um, I, I think it's strategic because they're seeing my videos. I get often people in our showroom I've never met and I say hi as I walk through. I say, oh, hi, Ryan, I watched all your videos. <laughs> and it's really, I'm very humble and, and it's really cute. Um, but also kind of means the strategy is working where I can be in the right position, albeit a recording or some information that we've, we've, uh, we've built for someone. Um, so I think really it's about managing my time, managing my diary and exposure, making sure I'm available enough to the teams and the leaders that need it, mm -hmm. um, which I hope will give me just enough time to make sure I'm still saying and sitting in those positions, which I love which is dealing with some clients, dealing at strategy level. Um, I, I'm a commercial thinker, so I really enjoy business. Um, it's not all hard and ugly for me. Uh, I'm a great technician, but I've also enjoyed the journey and, and learning. So I really actually enjoy the game of life, to be honest. So to be able to sit a little bit just behind and still have, have an ability to get these hands dirty is great, but also to be able to pull the strings and levers, which enables me to be that entrepreneur um, uh, works well. I hope I've answered the question. I'm not sure. I've jumped around a little bit, but, but hopefully, so, there's a, hopefully there's an answer somewhere in there. I think there's an answer in there somewhere. That's good. Um, I'm interested. I, the, the, the listeners might be able to see this, but I can see the big whiteboard behind you. Oh, I'm yes. interested to know what's on your whiteboard. What do you What do you measure? What is it yes. that you're keeping track of? Sorry, I, I should have sat in a beautiful coffee shop or in a garden or something. Oh, no, but, I'm loving this. Um, the, these are just a, it's a really visual tool, and I've actually had them in many of the businesses I've run, uh, typically mainly just for myself. This isn't for anyone else, but I do feel my team come in and they all list and look. And, and um, so effectively, from one side of the board, I've got one project manager's projects. Uh, I've actually got three here and then some inquiries over here. It's a little bit, may seem scrappy, but they're, they're literally um, a, a list of, as you can probably see every line times three, one, two, three. There's probably 
50 to 60 clients up there, I would suspect. So their names and we're prioritising across months, um, effectively job starts or project starts and when we might see them coming through from our funnel. Mm-hmm. Um, and that then helps me visually understand our priorities and how we then I communicate to my internal team, my operational team, my interior designers, et cetera, and how we prioritise the workflow on a weekly basis. Um, so it is a bit primitive. I get that. Wow, and um, I love it. But for me personally, and, and what you might like, Debris, they're all magnets. Ah. So I can just drag and drop and move a few around. And, and it, in a heartbeat, in a five minute conversation, we can start shifting those priorities. And then it does, uh, it is really just for me, but I do know the power of a visual tool in the office where someone can walk in and just say, oh, that one's been moved around. I'll go and work on something else. Um, but that's the basis of where I then can communicate outward to my team within the mm-hmm. business. So, what kind of meetings do you run in your business? Always a level 10, uh, Deborah. That's the right answer. No, no, we have our leadership meeting once a week. And then what I really love seeing, we've been implementing EOS for, I'd say, nine months, maybe not quite 12 months, but something like that. And um, have been now seeing, and I really love it, to actually sit in on one of my department meetings. It could be operations for our workflow and designers and internal staff. It could be construction, et cetera. Um, But now those, the leadership team or those department managers are also running our level 10 meeting, same template, same ethos, same times. Um, And it's interesting. I do see some of the water getting a little muddied as the lower um, you go down in our staffing hierarchy, but it's great to see that the education's there around why we're doing this and why it's important and why the framework is there. And even just seeing that same language, and I'm sure you get to see this all the time, but just the same language start to be said and spoken and, um, you know, to have people walking out of those meetings, holding up notepad, talking about their rocks. I can tell you a year ago, no one understood what a rock was in that format. Um, and so that for me has been really good. But yeah, so we, we effectively employ those uh, level 10 meetings through divisions. Um, I let my managers or leadership team have their own meetings. Otherwise, for me, it's really checking in with my sales and marketing team, um, individuals, and you know, trying to be strategic. But again, I'm not a micromanager. So there's plenty of meetings in my week, that's for sure, probably too many. But um, a lot of it now is oversight, a lot of it's strategy, a lot of it's quick decisions, a lot of it's okay, you know, I you trust you understand what I mean, you'll go off and do it. Um, or you make a start and show me next week. Often I'm, I'm very regular saying perfect, um, uh, progress over perfection. So I'm very big on helping people get and build momentum. Um, and often momentum builds traction itself. And that's more important than stopping, slowing down and, and aiming for perfection. Yeah. And it's a trap we can all kind of fall into, I think, particularly when we're driven and motivated as we are. Yeah. We're looking for it to be yeah, um, perfect. I've had to I, let go of that. <laughs> I think I was quite guilty. Well, I, I think we'd all be quite guilty of that for many years. But even probably recently, um, probably up to a couple of years ago, and I just couldn't, I just can't, I was so aware or, or self-aware that how many things were hinged off my, my ability to be available or my timing or my next meeting. Mm-hmm. And I could just see things slowing down around me because it was all on my desk waiting for Ryan's okay or waiting for. Um, and so quite deliberately for a period, I just said, you know what, you know, these people are here for a reason. I love them. I trust them. They're my, my family. They're my, my, my staff and my leaders. And um, yeah. So more often than not now, I just say, go and do it. And you know, to, to trust again that, that they know what they're doing and we can tweak things later or if it's really critical, they'll always wait on me. But at the same time, it's really about getting out of the way of others to allow them to succeed in their own way. We right. talk about letting go and it's really, it is really important. But I think once you've got the right structure and you've got the accountability chart and know what mm. people are accountable for, it just makes it a little bit easier as well to actually go, okay, it does. Um, we'll let you get on with that. Interesting, just, just talking about level 10 meetings. I mean, a lot of people kind of go, how can you possibly have the same um, agenda for a leadership team meeting as you can for a department meeting or even a sub-department meeting? Um and I'm always fascinated because I go, just give it a try, see how it goes. And, and they go, oh, actually, it works. And then they start using IDSing in their family if their family meetings as well, which is always kind of fun. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't so taken how- it, haven't taken it home yet, Deborah. I'm not sure where that'll go at the dinner table. But there's we'll a see. really great EOS family planning tool, but I'll, I'll know. I won't, I won't give you that just yet. Um, it'd be interesting. So tell me, you know, in terms of the department meetings, it, it would have been interesting for them to suddenly have this structure, which probably wasn't there before. How has that been accepted, and, and how does absolutely, it translate it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I use the example of maybe my construction team, and not to call them the lowest common denominator, but often you find tradespeople and who become supervisors, who become a project manager, or and they work their way up, but never have they been taught commercially, you know, a lot of things outside of their skill set. So I think it's a great example to use. But my, my guys and my, my, the people who would sit in that, man, it's not everyone, it's just the project managers, supervisors. Yep. Um, 
I think the first thing to go back a step, having a leadership team that you know took the time to uh, read traction or listen to uh, videos or content and, uh, and slowly understand, ask questions to give them the respect and time to develop things together and, and kind of not embed it because I don't think we're perfect even now, but to allow it to be unfold, uh, un- uh, unpacked or slowly embedded into a leadership team. It then meant it was a very casual and easy conversation, great, the same language back into their meetings. And so um, we also supported that division or department leader by myself and my you know, implementer also in the meeting for the first few to say, okay, guys, this is what we do and this is what it means and here's an explanation. And so we kind of took it lightly, I guess, a couple of meetings and unpacked it with them and then helped them set some rocks. Um, and then, you know, the next couple of weeks realised that their to-do list had to be done and there were consequences if they weren't. And so, you know, not, not force it down their throat, but really just help maintain structure around what that looked like and what the benefits were. Um, and to be honest, within, within a few weeks, it wasn't really even a confusing process. It wasn't challenged. It was just that's what we did. And mm-hmm. um and, you know, I think the little things like the guys giving the meeting a rating at the end of it, you know, they all got a buzz and a kick out of it. And there was always a joke because if someone joke, joke wasn't funny enough, then the, the rating went down. Or there, were, there was a little bit of context that actually helped also be a part of, you know, and a little laugh and a giggle that also got to kind of be a part of that meeting um, and the framework that we were trying to implement. So, um, look, it's been, to answer your point, it's been, they've been taking, taken on really good. Um, what's been, um, you know, interesting for us now we're kind of, say 90, uh, sorry, not 90 days, but or about 90 days, probably more. Um, sorry, nine months, I should say, into it with, yeah. with ours, but then maybe 90 days into theirs. Um, you're seeing what happens after a 30-day rock or a 90-day goal is, is actually um, achieved. And often for us, we're, we're still in the creating phase. So we're creating better systems. We're creating better processes. We're creating you know, tools or work on mini projects that have got a better what we do and how we deliver service. Mm-hmm. Um and so it's nice to achieve that. And what I've learned through watching others, um, I've been really uh, grateful to see my uh, department managers pick up on this. It's like, okay, guys, we've got that 90-day goal ticked off, but what's the next one? And they're setting these same rocks or similar uh, for the next 90 days, but they've kind of said, hang on a moment, we've just created this cool tool and a process last 90 days. Well, what do we do now? So part of our next 90-day rocks will also be to in more of the implementation or it might be a more of a, a review process or we're going to roll it out and then check on it. And then by the end of this 90 days, we're going to have that created, documented, tested, reviewed, feedback and re maybe re-jigged or, or created. So what I appreciate with that is it isn't just the meeting and having them think about goals and more so about the business and de- departments, but... It's actually changing how they think about, okay, cool. Well, that was a benefit for us to think about, talk about, document, but now what? You know, how do we actually roll it out? How do we see the value in it? How do we pick up the efficiency or get the, I don't know, saving of time or, or money, whatever it may be, which was the whole intent and purpose of doing it in the first place. So, so it's we kind changing of, their thinking, isn't it? They're becoming it more is, strategic yeah. into their yes. thinking. And we're yeah. seeing it's like stage one was thinking about what a rock and can we make the deadline? You know, pretty, pretty <laughs> basic. Can we get across the line? You know, can we cram? But yeah. stage or level two or, or stage two of the, the reward here for all of us is the thinking of, okay, well, we've got that done, but now how is it implemented and how can it benefit us and how can we enforce our teams to make sure they use it or, you know, how do we communicate better around it? So, and, and I think it's a perpetual thing, Deborah, to be honest, at some point, some of those gifts will keep giving for many months and many years in the future. So, yeah, pretty great. Lovely. Cool. Hey, what's been the biggest challenge that you've had, do you think, in your business the last five years? Apart from jib shortages, have you got jib shortages over there as well? Have we got? Yeah, we do. Oh, we've yeah. got all. We've man, you you know, we've um, we've, we've got a bit of everything. Yeah. It depends which month it is. I'll give you a different answer. Um, look, to be honest, without making it the easy one, but I've I've been in construction management or construction for about twenty five years, and in in some way of management or leadership roles for some twenty years, and. Um, I just haven't seen a challenging time in our space like the last 18 months. Um, and, and that's due to external factors um, in regards to post-COVID and the world and supply and materials, labour shortages. Um, <clears throat> so it's probably a pretty um, predictable answer for your listeners, I'm, I'm well aware. But I've been through quite a few shifts in this industry in quite a few different areas and niche products to luxury brands to home improvement brands to um, you know, and all kind of levels from mid to senior to executive um, leadership roles. And I've just never seen it like this time. So 
uh, there's a lot of factors there, and we're definitely not playing the victim. Um, you know, we're just modifying who we are and what we do to, to make sure we're sustainable and we're, we're, we're still leading the market moving out of this. But it's been really unpredictable, and that's probably perhaps like most of um, entrepreneurs you may know, we're control freaks in our own right, business owners. We, we like to be in control. And this has been one time or chapter that there has just been little to no opportunity to control the things around us, which has been really challenging. Um, but aside from that, uh, Deborah, because I think that's the easy answer everyone might predict for me to answer, I would say possibly um, the growth and the things that have come through growth. And of course, I was chasing growth for, for a number of years. Um, but growth brings with it growing pains. So growing pains being you need to hire, you need to fire, you need to manage differently, you need to recruit. And then it's about, geez, we need the systems. How come they're not doing the way I do it? Um, I it's, yeah. it's, it's about then saying, well, hang on, what do you mean we need another CRM or a bigger software package or a more this and more that? So there, there are absolute benefits and rewards out of acknowledging that the business has grown to those levels, but it does change your focus, especially as a business owner as well. Um, and so the challenges there were about keeping up. And probably for about three years, I've complained to anyone that would listen about the challenge of the business needing to keep up now. And that's keeping up with itself. You know, we all, all of a sudden had a brand that uh, we haven't advertised in, in over five years. And we, we are always booked out for nine months in advance. We are just perpetually always doing more work. We're multi-award winning. We do all of these great things. And the phone keeps ringing and we struggle to keep up. And we need more people. And it's this the snowball has kept rolling um, even without me pushing it. And then it's about keeping up, you know, do we have the right structure, the right systems, the right um, software, the right people, the right, you know, do we have enough to keep up? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So, so I think, um, you know, the post COVID life in our, in our industry, at least has been a, a challenge that I've just not seen in, in my, my career. But I do trust that we'll see a way out of that. And there's already some silver linings there. But to answer you, I think, yeah, both the success of growth and the challenges that come with such growth would be the challenge, probably the biggest challenge that I've, I've faced with everything chasing that snowball down that hill. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're running out of time. I can't believe it. it's gone so quickly. Who thought we could talk about construction for so long? Um, I'd love <laughs> to get some, some tips from you that I can share with the listeners that they can actually go and do, you know, in their own life. So what, what would be the three kind of top tips that you have either from a personal or professional level would like to share? Well, there's a couple of things that uh, when asked this or, <clears throat> you know, I feel that just naturally comes up in conversations with me. And I think I've even raised it once or twice already in today's mm -hmm. chat. Um, but one of them is really focusing on, and if you haven't recently, but getting back to considering doing what you love uh, in regards to being passionate. Um, I'm sure this talks to the EOS lifestyle planning and all those sorts of things, but, you know, cu cutting all the frameworks out of it, it's just being true to yourself. And by way of saying that sometimes you need to force yourself to sit down and think about that because obviously uh, often as business owners, we just get caught up in, in the machine or, chasing a snowball down a hill or pushing one up a hill. Um, but really, I think often we do forget to stop and think about, is this where I want to be? Is this the, you know, my, is it the lifestyle I want? Is it the vision that I had? And, and I mean that personally for uh, an entrepreneur, for a family, for, for children, for a future, for a, a lifestyle, how much time are you doing what you, you know, uh, would like to do. And I heard a great um uh, speaker recently kind of challenged us about, well, if you were to start tomorrow, what would the business look like? Who would the clients be? What would you earn? You know, do, look at your numbers. And, and I think it's a really great test to, for us to challenge ourselves with what would it look like if we had the chance? And then realise that we have the chance every day to create that. And, and often we're just not. And sometimes we're waiting a year, five, 10 or a lifetime to look back and then say, geez, well, I should have changed that earlier. Um, and we bring in consultants to tell us to stop and plan differently. When we knew it all along, we may just not have had the tools or the guts. Um, and I even know myself, I'll go years without stopping and thinking, thinking I'm chasing the fame, glory and the growth, but I'm, I'm just not. That was taken care of many years ago. So my, my, one bit of feedback um, would be to consider doing what you love, consider what your passion is and what does your lifestyle need to look like and start planning towards that, not about the business, and it's not always about the business. And I believe a business should be the tool in which you create that lifestyle with mm -hmm. and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, another might be uh, for me just about turning up every day. I truly believe, at least in my experience and in my industry, it's about turning up when the others don't. And I mean playing the long game. Yeah. So if you're going to be the best 
business coach. You're going to be the best electrician. You're going to be the best cook or the best cafe shop on the corner. It's about consistently turning up, consistently evolving, consistently challenging yourself, consistently asking the market, consistently improving, being better. And even if you are the best, you just need to keep showing up and offering consistency because most consumers, at least in my space, but I think and feel that most consumers across the globe in all industries want consistency. They want um, they want a history. They want experience. They want to know where you've been and who you are. But if you're, my belief is if you're doing what you love and you're passionate about it and you just get to keep showing up every day, life gets easier, right? Oh, absolutely. But people, yeah. but people love you more for it because you are consistent and delivering upon something you love and people understand that as well. So I think um, keep turning up mm-hmm. and choosing who you are when you do turn up every day is really important. <clears throat> Yep. Um, maybe my last one is I probably uh, touched on it in my first point about reviewing the model you operate under. Now, this talks to choosing the lifestyle or aiming for the lifestyle that you want, but mm-hmm. a very, very quick um, uh, explanation of that is just recently, uh, probably nine months ago, 12 months ago, perhaps, um, I, t- I kind of forced myself to take a formal review of the business. We do a, a different range of products in different areas, small, medium, large, et cetera. And just really realized that the ego in which I was displaying at the time, that of which would say we can do anything better than most. Um, I'm someone who likes to please people in my clients. So I'd rarely say no. And so all of a sudden I was catching myself out with a much greater risk doing a certain range of products uh, or building certain type of projects for people. We had dozens of them a year we were doing. And really, they just weren't performing for us. I'm more, more inclined to say we weren't performing well enough to make a good return from those pro- those projects. And so all of a sudden, I realized uh, that I was employing perhaps 30% of my team, um, 30% of our energy, you know, um, a high level of risk for these certain types of projects because we just weren't doing it well enough. We weren't quite on time. Um, our quality just wasn't quite there. And what it all boils down to is that I needed to start saying no more often. Mm. I needed to focus on what we were good at. Now, between you and I, I'm really good at all of them, uh, but I'm not a know-all. As a team, we weren't delivering in some areas. And the reality was that we didn't need to do that. We needed to choose and review, was it because we loved doing it? And if so, we'd, end it, we'd put more energy in team or we'd get better. Or was it just because I needed to start saying no to some people? And in fact, maybe we shouldn't be everyone to, uh, sorry, everything to everyone. And so I guess my third and last one is about reviewing where you're at, uh, identifying what you're good at, what makes, what's more profitable for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was identifying that I wanted, I was sitting in that part of the market and employing maybe 30% of my team for no return for no return and with greater risk. So it forced me to realize what we wanted to do, what we were well known for, what we were great at, what brought us better returns, what allowed me to sleep well at night, what allowed me to know that we're going to deliver more quality, more regular to more people. And so that allowed me to get out of trying to driving a lane that we weren't as comfortable in, um, which brings me back to the first point, doing more of what you love to be, yeah. to be rewarded by. Um, and it's the hedgehog concept from Jim Collins in terms of, you know, mm. you're never going to die of starvation. There's so many opportunities out there, but the, the clearer you can get about what you love and what you're the best in the world out there, yes. the easier your life becomes. Yeah. Yes, 100%. And so that that was a forced, I wouldn't say structural change, but we've already stopped taking on a certain type of project that we're doing a dozen of a year, multi-million dollar turnover just in that, that, that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and already we're starting to see a trend and a shift. Our risk is lowered. We've still got a few on the books. We're, we're wrapping up, but that's deliberate. And for me to share with your listeners why that's important is because we sometimes get caught out just doing things because people turn up or the phone rings or you think that, yes, I should take that on because it's more revenue. When revenue, I've learned, means nothing. You know, it's the profitability margins left at the bottom line is what gives us the opportunity to have those lifestyles. And that's and how you feel about it too, because I think you made a really important point, is that yeah. if you're taking on this risk and you're perhaps not living to the level of quality that you want or um, consistency, then you're not going to feel good about it either. 100%. And it extends to being a hamster on the wheel too. You're just continually just running and chasing and delivering. Pro- and, and, if, and if you can lower that and still make the same or have a better outcome or balance, then... Um, so, yeah, that, that was something I, I wouldn't say I was unaware of it. I was just watching it for a while and kept seeing it. And I knew it, but it was really about, and maybe it was a COVID situation and some challenges in our industry, but it really forced me to sit down and say, you know what, it, it kills me to say that we're not doing this really well enough. 
um, but also make, made me face that whole ego discussion of, well, who are we doing this for? You know, and do we need to do this at all? And so we've just taken the last you know, kind of 12, uh, nine to 12 months and we're just shifting. We're just turning in a big boat. We're just just swinging around a couple of degrees at a time um, and we're just doing more of what we're great at, more of what supports and sustains us um, and more of what we love. So, and, and to be honest, it's also minimising my risk, meaning if, if I'm going to do 100 projects a year or, you know, build, build the projects that we do, then... We want to know that there's, you know, both myself and my clients have the best, most certainty around what we're delivering and we're, we're giving them the best outcomes. So that's been a huge shift for me. So my to, to boil that all the way down to a little um, bullet point there would be stopping, looking back, seeing what's working within your business, planning ahead, making sure that's part of your planning. Don't just be a hamster on the wheel and keep turning up and saying yes to everyone because... I feel that that's where burnout can be found. That's where, you know, stress and risk and loss and, and, and issues at home and all sorts of stuff can come from that level of, um, you know, productivity that doesn't give you the return, that energy that we expel that may not support us. So for me, that's been a big shift. It's a big shift in my industry. It's a 12-month turning. Um, we're over halfway there and I can see the silver lining again. It's going to put us in a much better position post-COVID as well. So I'm quite grateful. Because it's the opportunity cost. If you're doing that sort of work that isn't the, the, the work that makes your heart sing that you can really deliver the best um, possible value on, then you're actually taking up time that could be used for things that you are much, much better at. Yeah, you're 100% right. And dispelling mm. that energy in areas that don't support or sustain you, the business or the team, you know, it, it just, it, it, it's okay for a little bit. And I know as your listeners and business owners will, you know, we see it every day, you know, the unproductive time or hours spent, but there's nothing better than, you know, having your team do things that you love for happy clients and also being well rewarded for it. Um, and for me, we've just become a popular brand. I wouldn't call it an overnight success. We work very hard, but it's, it's, we literally can't keep up with inquiry anymore. We don't advertise, which is all great. Um, and so it's kind of forced me also to be selective. I, I just, we cannot anymore even contemplate um, supporting everyone and working with everyone. So it's really, you know, forced me to consider, especially through a challenging time in the industry, what, what we're good at and where we should be heading. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, look, congratulations on what you've got to. It is just phenomenal to see. I, I look forward to seeing the growth over the next few years as well and seeing you spend time with your family and, and do the things that you get to love outside of work. Um, thank you for sharing with us today. Uh, it's been really, really helpful to hear your perspective on things. And yeah, I look forward to catching up with you in person when we get together in Sydney. Yes, looking forward to it. Thanks so much for having me on, Deborah. Really uh, uh, quite, quite honoured to be uh, offered the opportunity and um, yeah, love what you do. And um yeah, hopefully it, uh, today has been okay for your listeners. But thanks again Absolutely. for having me. Now, but one last thing before we go. If people want to get in contact with you, how would they get in contact with you? Yeah, great. Um, so mode, M-O-D-E group, .com.au. We're based in Melbourne. Um, we do a bit of work around the place. But, um, yeah, that's probably the best place to, to, to find me, see yeah. some of my videos and some information about our beautiful work and our great team. And, um, yeah, if you're in Melbourne or need a good builder or some advice in Australia, or anywhere, love to help, reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. It's been really, really amazing. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me again. Thank you.